When I made my previous video, I started off by pointing out that I rejected the idea of true objectivity. And of course, a lot of people stumble right at that first hurdle and cannot get their head around what I actually mean by that. Which is a pity because further on in the video, I explain that even within the context of rejecting objectivity at the fundamental level, it is still possible to establish fact. And I explained in that video what I meant by that. I understood fact within the context of a not fundamentally objective reality to be the product of a successful communication between two sentient entities. In other words, I communicate something to you, you understand what I am saying, or at least you think you understand what I am saying, and then within the context of how you have understood what I am communicating, you then can verify that what I have communicated does appear to be consistent with what you have understood from my communication and what you understand about reality. Once all those bits are in place, we, between us, have established a fact. But I think it is also important maybe to show you a couple of examples of this and then maybe you get a better idea of what I mean when I talk about this successful communication between two people. Because when people communicate, they communicate in many different languages. And I don't just mean the ordinary national languages like English or French or Dutch or whatever else, but also I can talk about the language of different formal systems in which we might be communicating. And it is very important when you look at a communication that you communicate, you understand what is being said in that communication within the context of the language in which it is presented. So let me, for example, talk to you about the example of antinatalism which is something that I've made a few videos about. And these people, the so-called antinatalists, present their ideas as being objective, logical, and rational. So when I respond to antinatalists, I will work extremely constrained within pure logical rationality and I then proceed to take their logic, their rationality, to its inevitable and utterly insane conclusions and throw that back at them. That is why I keep presenting antinatalists with the suggestion that they should take a shotgun, load it up with a deer slug, take due diligence to make sure that they place it squarely in their mouth and pointed towards the back of their head and then pull the trigger. After all, this is completely unemotional and undeniable logic. If you do that, if you follow those instructions carefully and make sure that you have a fully functional shotgun and deer slug, you will achieve two things. One, you will immediately, instantly, without feeling, you won't even hear the bang, you will cease, terminate any suffering that you may be experiencing right now. Secondly, you will reduce the probability of experiencing any further suffering instantly to exactly zero. It's a win-win situation, according to the antinatalist insane logic. And there is no argument against it, either. Antinatalists have, of course, thrown hissy fits over this and started throwing things back at me as saying, like saying, you know, some poor schmuck has to clean up the mess and how will this affect the people who love the antinatalists? But ultimately, 
we have to point out that in the Antonatalist set of premises, it is clearly presented that the wants and needs of any third party cannot override, supersede, and make subordinate the wants and needs or the potential for suffering of the entity under consideration. The mistake the antenatalists make is that the only entity that they ever consider for their deranged philosophy is this so-called potential human being of which they are trying to prevent the creation. And by taking their logic to its ex insane extreme, we can show them how idiotic their logic really is. That is antenatalism. Another good example of this is a discussion I have on occasion with these so-called doomsday prophets that go about predicting doom and gloom and terrible cataclysmic events for certain dates in the future. These people use a different language. They use the language of science. They talk about epigees and perihelions and all sorts of other kind of cosmological terms with which they try to support their deranged claims. And in response then, I will use exclusively scientific language in order to kick their nuts, basically, for want of a better expression. So when somebody starts telling me that on the 17th of October, for example, I've been having a hilarious conversation with some nut job on one of my previous videos, and I'll put a link to it in the underbar. They start talking about a something happening on the 17th of October. Now, after I started pointing out to them that there will not be an earthquake of magnitude 8 or higher on the 17th of October, and yes, I know, I'm sticking my neck out here a little bit, but I'm playing the game of odds with some good hope that, you know, I'm playing it well and that I'll be okay. But yes, there certainly won't be any cataclysmic earthquake. If there's going to be an, an earthquake of cataclysmic proportions, and considering what we have experienced and easily lived through as the human race at least, I'm not talking about the poor unfortunates who actually got caught up in tsunamis and so on, because for them it's a personal tragedy, and I will not diminish that in any way, shape or form. But for humanity as a whole, we have easily survived and lived through earthquakes of magnitude 9.5. So if the doomsday prophecies have any validity to, to them whatsoever, then whenever somebody prophesies or predicts a cataclysmic earthquake or something of that nature, we should be looking at a magnitude 10 or higher, something that will actually rip the planet apart, so to speak. And that's not going to happen on the 17th of October. Or when this guy starts talking about the pole shifts, the funny thing is that he has actually got a valid point in one sense that the poles are going to shift, the magnetic poles are going to shift at some point, probably not even in the all too distant future. But to say that it's going to happen on the 17th of October is bat shit insane. And anybody with any sort of sense of the sort of statistic underpinnings of the science of these things can see why it is perfectly reasonable for me to present a counterclaim that no such thing, no pole shift, will happen precisely on that date of the 17th of October. And when some nut job then starts talking to me about Elenin like events, again I can talk back to them using the language of science and point out that there are clear differences between what they try to pull off as an Elenin like event, which didn't even happen on the 17th of October because the two events that they're trying to throw into the mix happened on the 5th and the 12th of October. And what are they? They are uh, near-Earth objects passing the Earth within less than half a lunar distance. Ooh, that's very scary. 
until you realize and you start looking at the statistics and you see that this sort of occurrence, some object with a size of less than 100 meter diameter passing the Earth at less than half a lunar distance, is an occurrence that you can expect to happen about once or twice every month. So what's so special about the 17th of October? Nothing. How else is this thing supposed to be an Elenin-like event? Uh, well, Elenin was a comet which passed about one-fifth of an astronomical unit at the closest point, which is ballpark, the same sort of distance that the minimum distance we can expect between Earth and something like Venus or Mars, just to give you a feel of how idiotic these claims are. This thing is supposed to be a comet, which was a comet, which has a mass, what? not very high compared to a planet anyway, which doesn't, didn't get any closer to Earth than two of our neighboring planets. And then these people claiming that this would exert a sort of influence on Earth that would cause an earthquake. Using the language of science, you can show how idiotic such claims are and how you can simply just point at such idiots and laugh at them because they have nothing to go on. Similarly, Elenin was a comet that disintegrated a few months ago and has pretty much left without a trace, whereas these things are asteroids that passes within less than half a lunar distance and just went on their merry way wherever they're going next. We can plot of all the objects that we know are out there and that we know the locations and the velocities of, we can plot where they're going to be in the next 100 years. We can predict near-Earth encounters with these objects 70 years into the future without any problem using scientific language. This is what is important to understand, that even when you do realize that true objectivity is not possible in this universe, we are still able to speak to each other, to communicate to each other using this language of science that is so precise and so accurate that we can know things like the fact that certain asteroids that we know are out there are not going to hit the Earth in the next several hundred years with a sort of accuracy that can establish what's going to happen as a fact. Maybe not an objective fact as such, but still enough of a fact to make that word valid to use. Make that a reasonable word to use within the context. So don't look at me saying that true objectivity doesn't exist and conclude from that that I am some fairy, airy fairy, new age idiot trying to sell you the secret because I most certainly am not.